Aw oh, man, I only have six pieces, but I need eight to be happy. You know what? Me too. I only have six pieces as well. Tell you what, how about I loan you two for now, and then afterwards, you can help me out. That sounds like a good plan. Here you go, sibling. Thanks so much. Oink, oink, book, book. Oink, oink, book, book. That's a wonderful farm. Thank you so much, sibling. Here's your two back, and here's two more for you. Why, thank you. <laughs> you know what? We make an awesome team. We definitely do. When nonmetals bond together, they share their valence electrons to become chemically stable. This type of bond is known as a covalence bond, where electrons are periodically shared between all of the atoms. Covalent bonds usually result in the formation of individual molecules, or molecular compounds. Let's compare the differences between a covalent bond and an ionic bond. Ionic bonds are formed when electrons are taken from metals and received by nonmetals. Since there is a charge imbalance between the metals and nonmetals, they usually stick together in ginormous chunks and form big crystalline structures, like in table salt. Meanwhile, in covalent bonds, the electrons are routinely shared between the nonmetals. Since there is a less of a charge imbalance, the nonmetals stay together to make their own pack. In chemistry, this is known as the formation of a molecule. The naming system of nonmetals bonding together is completely different than ionic compounds. Since two nonmetals can bind together in many different ratios, the naming convention has to give account of the quantity of each nonmetal using Greek prefixes. For a count of one, we use the prefix mono. For a count of two, di. Three, tri. Four, tetra. Five, penta. Six, hexa. Seven, hepta. 8. Octa, 9. Nona, and 10. Deca. There is one exception. If the first nonmetal already has a quantity of 1, you do not need to prefix it with mono. Let's go through some examples. There are two different types of carbon oxides. Remember, carbon and oxygen are both nonmetals. If the molecule consists of just one carbon and two oxygens, you have the formation of carbon dioxide. It's a relatively harmless gas, as our bodies naturally reject it all the time when we exhale. However, the second kind of carbon oxide is quite deadly, carbon monoxide. As the name implies, carbon monoxide contains one carbon and one oxygen. Carbon monoxide is a deadly gas, as your lungs can't tell the difference between oxygen gas and carbon monoxide and unfortunately will replace the oxygen in your bloodstream with carbon monoxide. In summary, this is the reason why nonmetals need prefixes, as saying carbon oxide alone does not differentiate between a harmless gas and a deadly gas. Let's go through a few more examples. This molecule contains one nitrogen and one oxygen, so this is known as nitrogen monoxide. Again, the prefix mono is not necessary to describe the single count of the first nonmetal, nitrogen, but is required to describe the single count of the second nonmetal, which is oxygen. Here's another one. This chemical formula describes a compound with two nitrogens and three oxygens. So the nomenclature for this molecule is dinitrogen trioxide. What about this example? I hope that you didn't accidentally write down this, as iron is classified as a metal. Also, since iron is multivalent, the proper nomenclature for this is iron 3 oxide. There is a special class of molecular compounds known as diatomic molecules. Di refers to a count of two, so a diatomic molecule is made up of two of the same exact element. 
In total, there are seven diatomic molecules that exist. Hydrogen, oxygen, fluorine, nitrogen, bromine, iodine, and chlorine. For example, oxygen gas is always formed with two oxygen atoms. There are memory aids for remembering these seven diatomic molecules. The first one is noticing that you can visualize the number 7 in the periodic table, with hydrogen as the outlier. The other memory aid is a mnemonic, the evil Dr. Dr. Hoffenbrickel. Remember rule number 1? All atoms need their valence shell to be full to become chemically stable. Most atoms need 8 electrons in their valence shell to be full, and once the outer shell is full, it forms something called a stable octet. Keep this in mind when we start drawing these diagrams called Lewis structures. Let's go through some examples of diatomic molecules. Oxygen gas is always formed with two oxygen atoms. Looking up on the periodic table, oxygen contains six valence electrons, so it needs two more electrons to become chemically stable. When you place two oxygen atoms near each other, both atoms realize that they need two more electrons to become chemically stable. So just like good siblings, they will share their toys, I mean electrons. The first oxygen will loan out two of its electrons to the second oxygen. In return, the second oxygen will return back the two electrons it has borrowed and loan out two electrons to the first oxygen. Since two electrons are shared between the two atoms, this type of bond is known as a double bond. In a Lewis structure, this bond can be described by drawing two horizontal lines between the two oxygen symbols. Or if you own this toy, thanks Dr. Muller, you can show a double bond with two of these sticky things. Hooray! A molecule of oxygen gas! <sighs> How about a molecule of nitrogen gas? Taking a peek on the periodic table, Nitrogen has five valence electrons and will need to share three more electrons to become chemically stable. Lo and behold, a second nitrogen nearby is willing to share three electrons, resulting in a very strong triple bond. This triple bond makes nitrogen rather inert, which is why nitrogen is often pumped into car tires or into food products like coffee pods to keep the coffee grinds fresh. Try drawing the Lewis structures for the remaining diatomic molecules. Did you get all of them correct? Awesome! Let's keep going! Some molecular compounds go by a common name. For example, H2O could technically be described as dihydrogen monoxide, but most people would rather call this molecule water. Nitrogen trihydride is commonly known as ammonia. Dihydrogen dioxide is commonly known as hydrogen peroxide. Carbon tetrahydride is commonly known as methane gas. And lastly, trioxygen is commonly known as ozone gas. One last thing, do not reduce the ratios for covalent bonds. Here is an example of why not. The chemical formula for ethane is C2H6. The first carbon will share three of its electrons with three hydrogens surrounding it, and will share one electron with the carbon to its right. The carbon on the right also shares three of its electrons with three other hydrogens surrounding it. The carbons in the middle each have four valence electrons of their own, and will borrow four more from their surrounding friends to become stable. Hydrogen only needs two electrons to become chemically stable, so each hydrogen will borrow one electron from the carbons in the middle. So, ethane is chemically stable when it has two carbons and six hydrogens. Let's say you accidentally reduce the ratio of C2H6 down to CH3. As you can see, although the three orbiting hydrogens are chemically stable, the carbon in the middle is unstable as it only has 7 out of the electrons needed and has not formed a stable octet. This is the reason why ethane has to be C2H6 and not accidentally reduced down to CH3. 
pause the video and take the time to work on today's worksheet. When you have completed it, continue with this video as I briefly give the solutions to problem set number 4. Remember, sodium is a metal, so this is an ionic compound. Sodium will give up its one electron to the chlorine, which coincidentally needs one more electron to become chemically stable. Hydrogen has one valence electron and needs one more to become chemically stable. So each hydrogen will borrow one electron from each other. Also, remember that hydrogen only has one shell. So the first valence shell only needs two electrons to become chemically stable. Fluorine has seven valence electrons and needs to borrow one electron from the adjacent fluorine to become chemically stable. Oxygen has six valence electrons and will need to borrow two valence electrons from the oxygen on the right to become chemically stable. Nitrogen has five valence electrons and will need to borrow three electrons from the adjacent nitrogen to become chemically stable. For a water molecule, each hydrogen will borrow one valence electron from the oxygen, and the oxygen will borrow one valence electron from each of the two hydrogens. You might notice that the atoms of water molecules do not form a straight line. This results in an unbalanced charge, which is why water is slightly sticky. An ethanol molecule will have two carbons in its middle. The carbon on the left will borrow three valence electrons from three hydrogens. The carbon on the right will borrow two electrons from one hydrogen above and one hydrogen below. It will also borrow one electron from the carbon to the left and will borrow one last electron from the hydroxide ion. Methane has one carbon in the middle and it will borrow four electrons from the four hydrogens surrounding it. Carbon dioxide will have one carbon in the middle and the carbon will borrow two electrons from an oxygen to its left and will borrow two more electrons from an oxygen to its right. Although drawing Lewis structures is a senior chemistry topic, it's nice to have a basic understanding of how molecular compounds bond together. That way, you'll know why you cannot reduce ratios of certain compounds, like hydrogen peroxide. Until our next adventure together.